All right. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. All right. We have, uh, we have some new faces here, or maybe just a new face, and then uh, some familiar faces, and then some people in the back, I think, that I can't see because it's so dark. There's some people in the back, right? Like one or two? No? Okay. I think, I think that's Andrew over there, right? That's Andrew over there. Okay. Dude, you're wearing black, and like, it's like real black. It's like you're like a chair. You're just one of the chairs right now. Okay, good. Is there someone over there, too? Is that Yunjong over there? Okay, got you. All right. All right, great. Well, it's great to be, to be back here worshiping the Lord together in, uh, in our normal location. But wherever we worship, the, the, the building or the location don't matter. Amen? It's the people, it's the gathering of the saints that is the true church and the true temple of God. And uh, so wherever we are, we worship in spirit and in truth. Now, uh, today, or last two weeks, we, uh, we touched on this topic of family. Of family, But we're going to shift gears a little bit um, in light of our context and what's going on these days in the church. And so we're going to look at 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 16 to 17. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 16 to 17. All right. So why don't we read this together as a body on the count of three. On one, two, three. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, or is it Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set, oh, it's not there. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle. That David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Amen. All right. Uh, for some of you that may not know, uh, our church, we are a house of prayer. And what we mean by that is not some kind of special movement that is, that is like particular. No one else is doing it, right? Uh, if you look in the scripture, Jesus says clearly in Isaiah, in Matthew, right? He says, my house is a house of prayer, or my house shall be a, called a house of prayer for all nations. Amen? So when we say the church is a house of prayer, we're not saying anything that's un unscriptural. We're not saying anything that's out of the, the norm for what a church should be, right? The church is called to be a house of prayer and a house of worship for all nations, right? Now, so we have a 24-hour uh, literal house of prayer where people can go in, any day of the week, any time of the week, and just go in and pray. Um, of course, there's different kinds of uh, ways that, you know, we operate the house of prayer. Sometimes there's devotionals. People are up there doing worship devotionals, right? Sometimes we have worship services where people, are, uh, teams are going up there and doing, you know, intercession and prayer like we do on Saturday nights. And then sometimes there's just music playing, loud music, especially here in Korea. They love doing cry out prayer in Korea. So they have a cry out prayer time where we have uh, just loud music playing, worship songs, and people go in there, and they're just crying out to the Lord, right, just in prayer, letting it all out, right, instead of the, the normal ice cream and wine that, you know, the world likes, right, <laughs> you go through a breakup, you get some ice cream and wine, not that, right, you, you're resorting to crying out to the Lord in prayer with broken and contrite spirits, and those are the sacrifices that the Lord does not despise, amen, amen. So, so this uh, house of prayer, 24 hours operational, uh, we've been doing it for uh, quite a couple years now. I believe it's been seven years. Uh, maybe it's been longer than that. It's eight years uh, since the house of prayer has been operational um, for 24 hours. Now, uh, with that said, we are contending uh, for a 72-hour worship and prayer conference uh, next week. And this will be the second time our church has organized something like this before. Last year, last year, around the same time, we held the same thing called Davis Tent, right? And it is a 72-hour nonstop, unending uh, worship and prayer conference starting from this year. It will be Sunday, 4 p.m., right, all the way until Wednesday, 4 p.m. There will be worship and prayer and, you know, the word being proclaimed nonstop uh, for those 72 hours, Right? And so this 
uh, is something that we are uh, planning, have been coordinating as a church for months now. And uh, many people might ask, why is David's tent, a 72-hour worship and prayer conference, why is that so important? Why is that necessary, right? Can't you just worship, uh, you know, like while you're walking? Because, you know, we can worship at all times. Amen? Worship is not just like the motion of worshiping, right? You could be worshiping right now. I'm sure everyone, right, even in their normal labor, normal work, students, studying at school, whatever it may be, all of that labor is worship. Amen? So we have an understanding of that already. We don't want to get back into that. But worship is not just the motion of going to a church and lifting up your hands and singing songs, right? However, why are we contending for this thing called David's tent? Well, in the scripture, it says this. It says that the king is enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Amen? It says that Jesus, the king, God himself, is enthroned upon the praises of Israel. And now we take this quite literally, right? There is a power in actually lifting out your voice, lifting up your voice and crying out in song and in praise and proclamation, speaking those prophecies, right? Proclaiming the word. There is a power when you speak that out. It says that Jesus is enthroned upon the praises of his actual people crying out in worship and exalting him. Amen? Because you know what? We could all be here just going like, Right? But there's quite a difference when I come up here and I say, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, we worship you, we lift up your name. There's a difference between that and just me going, right? Just even practically. But there's a spiritual principle there. We have a mouth for a reason, right? We have a mouth for a purpose. It is to proclaim the goodness of the Lord. It is to exalt the name of Jesus higher and higher. And you know what? Everyone worships something. All of us worship something, regardless of what it, we may think it may be, right? We worship something, but Jesus, uh, not Jesus, God says in, in, in Exodus, right? Let my people go that they may serve me. Meaning what? There is a calling on every one of our lives. God has designed each and every one of his creation to do what? To serve him, to worship him. To meaning, we can go and worship other things. We can go and worship other idols, but the design, the original intent for all of his creation was to worship God. If I say something wrong, I like, eh, right? <laughs> Ding, right? Nice. What was that? Was that a, a computer thing? Oh, okay, great, great. I like that, actually. That was kind of cool. Anyway, so why are we contending for this 72-hour conference? Because our worship, like I said earlier, our worship is not just some kind of religious motion, right? Regardless of what you may feel, Regardless of what the atmosphere might look like, what might feel like, regardless of how many people are here, the worship that we give to the Lord, that is not a, a feeling atmospherical thing. When we give worship to the Lord as a body of Christ, Christ is enthroned. Amen? This is the, the principle that God has laid out for us here, right? So why, why the 72 hour? When we gather as the body of Christ, not just our church, but people from all over the nations are coming, right? People from Brazil, people from the States, right? People from all over Korea, they're gathering here. We're going to have 3,000 people at this conference crying out to the Lord, worshiping the Lord together. And we believe that these cries are going to shake the spiritual atmosphere of this nation. Amen? It's going to shake the spiritual atmosphere of this nation because when we lift up all 3,000 of us lifting up the name of Jesus, and there is power and authority in that name. It's not the power and authority in the name, in the worship, right? The power and authority is not us just going and, and gathering as 3,000 people and being as loud as we can. There's no power in that. That's just being loud, right? But when we gather as one body and lift up our voices to worship the one true king, and he is established in that throne, that would change a nation, Amen? That is what we're contending for. And when we do this, we are contending through his throne, the establishment of that kingdom, that there will be revival breaking out in this nation through repentance, through unity, right? Because you know what? Like I said, there's people coming up from all over the nation, all over the nations gathering in this revival, uh, this 72-hour uh, conference, right? 
And when the, the body of Christ unites, and when the body of Christ repents, genuine repentance, revival breaks out. Amen? And so it's absolutely important what we're doing here, right? It's not just some kind of conference. It's not just another show or performance to say, hey, we're a church that, that uh, you know, worship for 72 hours. I bet you can't beat that. It's almost like people who, you know, who say, hey, I fasted for this, this many days. It's almost like a performance, but that's not what we're doing here, right? And so I, I, I bless you to uh, go with the understanding, even if you're not attending this event, I bless you and I ask that you will continue to pray and intercede with us that this uh, 72 hours, these 72 hours would impact the heavens and that the, the, the spiritual atmosphere and the air of this nation would completely shift and change in this time. Amen? All right. Now, this passage that we uh, just read right here, it's, it's such a, a famous passage that many of us are already familiar with it, especially if you've been acquainted with the house of prayer. Uh, but just to give a little background, just in case you don't, um, this is the picture. This is the picture in the moment where King David is now bringing this thing called the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, which is a golden chest. It's like a golden box, right? It's made of wood, but it's plated with, with gold. And he's bringing this thing back uh, from way over out there in, in this place called, I, I don't know how to pronounce the name very well. It's like Ker Kirjath Jirim or something like that, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not Jerusalem, but it's Kirjat Jirim. I think that's how you pronounce it, right? So he's bringing this. I believe there's a lot of echo on this one. Okay, this happened before. Thank you, thank you, sir. All right. All right, let's pray. Let's give God a, little, a shout of praise real quick. Let's give God hallelujah. It don't matter what the mic situation is. God's going to continue to do his work. Amen. All right, so um, David, right, he's bringing back this Ark of the Covenant. This is a golden box, a golden chest, right? And he's bringing it back, and he's, uh, he's taking it. This is right after he's become king, right? And just to give you a picture of what's going on, he's erected a tent for this Ark uh, apart from the tent or the tabernacle that has already been set up for sacrifices in the morning and at night, this has been around in, in Israel since Exodus, right? So they've been worshiping the Lord and sacrificing. The priestly order has been established already, right? You know, killing lambs and rams, all that, all that stuff, right? But David, once he becomes king, he brings this ark that has been lost. The ark was built at the time of Moses, but he brings this ark that was lost for many, many years. And I'll get into the details a little bit later. And he places it in this new tent in his kingdom as soon as he becomes king. And I'm going to get into why this is so important and crucial for us in this time. Now, way back in the days of Eli, in the days of the prophet Samuel, before there was even a king in the nation of Israel, right, uh, there, there's, this ark was taken into the battle against the Philistines, and because of Israel's sin, because of Israel's corruption, this ark is lost and captured uh, by the Philistines, right? So the Philistines take this ark of the covenant, and what we have to understand here is, is the ark of the covenant is not just some random box, right? It ain't no jack-o'-lantern. It's, 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 it's not the box itself that's important, but what does this box represent? It is the presence of God that literally manifested itself in this box called the Ark, of the Ark of the Covenant, or chest or box, whatever you want to call it, right? So God would literally dwell with his people. His glory would literally be upon this box, right, in, the, in this chest called the Ark of the Covenant. And so this is not a normal box, right? This is divinity right here. Not the box itself, but the presence of God. Now, the Philistines, not knowing this, right, they capture, they take this box like it's some kind of relic, or some kind of artifact, right? And what happens to them for seven months, curses just begin to plague the Philistines left and right, right? The Ark of the Covenant is just some, some thing that looks like this, right? And right next to it is, is, is their god Dagon, right? And next morning you wake up and the head of Dagon is cut off just because a box was laying right next to it. 
And so sickness starts to come up. Tumors start to come up. All of these things for seven months starts to plague the Philistines. And now the Philistines say, what? I don't want this thing anymore. Get this thing away from me. Right? So they send the, the, the Philistines, they send the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel. And it ends up in a hilly place called, again, I don't know how to pronounce this thing. Kerjath Jerim. Is that right? The, oh, wow. That sounds real good. How do you say that? Kirgath Hedim. Kirgath Hedim. All right? That sounds right. Mine sounds wrong, right? Mine sounds like a romanization. Kirgath Jerim, right? Kirgath Hedim. Okay. They, they send it over to a place called Kirgath uh, Hedim. It ends up in a place called Kirgath Hedim, right? And it stays there for a long time. Now, mind you, this ark has a proper place. There's a proper place for this, this, this ark. And it is within the tabernacle where God chooses to dwell. But this ark is now lost in a, in a faraway hilly place for lots, lots and lots of years. And now after this thing goes over there, Saul becomes king, right? Saul's anointed king. And for 40 years of Saul's reign, he doesn't even think about this ark. He neglects the ark, right? And after Saul... Uh, Saul dies, and David finally becomes king. Even after he becomes king, David does not, does not take this ark back, right? Seven years, he becomes king after he gets Hebron or Hebron. And then after seven years, he finally captures Jerusalem. Jerusalem is like the last, the end of this, right? The end of the war. He, he captures Jerusalem, he gets the capital, and now he becomes fully king over the nation of Israel. Amen. So David becomes fully king, established as fully and complete king over the nation of Israel. And the first thing he does when he becomes the king of Israel is let's go get this box. Let's go get this Ark of the Covenant. Now you got to think about how crazy that would sound in this age right now. Like if there's a president that gets elected, right? And the first thing, I mean, you got all sorts of problems going on. You got like, you know, uh, like abortion laws and and uh, gun laws and violence, all of that thing, like global climate, global warming, all these things that are issues in these days. And he goes home to be president. And the first thing he says is, I'm going to go get a box from Greenland. That would blow our minds, right? That would be, really, be really weird. We wouldn't really accept that. And so he, the first thing he does as he becomes king is saying, let's go and retrieve this Ark of the Covenant. And he takes this from a personal matter to a national matter. He lets everyone know. And he's saying this is something that we have to do. This is of utmost, important, up, uh, utmost importance. Let's take the Ark of the Covenant and bring it back to where? To Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Now, before we get into that, let me explain a little bit more. The Ark of the Covenant, a gold box with two cherubim angels. It looks like a box with like angel wings, right? And on this or in this are two tablets, which are the Ten Commandments, right? Aaron's rod. And a piece of manna, we won't go into all of that, uh, all of those details. But again, this is the place where God's presence would dwell. This is the place where God's manifest glory chose to dwell in, uh, in the times of the Exodus, right? Now, why is this important? Because this is the point of connection between God and man. Amen? The Ark of the Covenant was the point of connection between God and man. How do we know this? Let's go to Exodus 25, 22. Exodus 25, 22. It says this. There, meaning the Ark of the Company, right? There I will meet you, and from above the mercy seat, which is the lid of the Ark, right? From between the two cherubim, the angels, which are upon the Ark of the Testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. Amen? So literally... Literally, like back in the day, Moses or, you know, Aaron, right, they, they, they would go and look at this box. And the box, not the box itself, right, but God would speak to them through the mercy seat, through the Ark of the Covenant. You guys understanding this? Is this making sense? The Ark of the Covenant was the point of connection between God and and man, meaning what? God speaks through the ark. He dwells with them through the ark. He rules through the, war, the ark. The ark is his presence. It is his glory. And it is his throne. Now, think about this for a second. This is a high and lofty God. This is the God of all creation. 
This is God who's uncreated, right? He's not bound by time. He's not bound by space. He's not bound by anything. He's infinite. Amen? God is infinite. Amen? Let's say that together. God is infinite. He's infinite. So meaning he's not able to be bound by time. He's not bound by space. Yet, what does he do? He's everywhere. He's everywhere. He's, om he's omnipresent. Yet, he chooses to dwell in this place. He's not bound by time, but he binds himself to time. He's not bound by space, yet he binds himself to space within this little box. Why? For the sake of his people. Because there's uh, uh, the children of Israel, as, as they're in the wilderness, they're lost. They're in the wilderness, in the exodus. And for the sake of his people, he binds the high and lofty ones. He binds himself to their experience and he dwells in the midst of them. And in the same way, what, how do we understand this? We fast forward way over to the New Testament. And in the same way, what does the ark represent? It represents Christ. Meaning what? Christ, just like God in the Old Testament, he, the high and lofty one, would dwell in the Ark of the Covenant. Christ, in all his glory, he ripped off that glory and humbled himself. A God who doesn't have flesh and blood took on flesh and blood and bones and stress and all of that, right? He took that on and he chose, though he's everywhere, he chose to dwell in the midst of us as a man. Amen? And now what? Even taking it further, he's crucified, he dies, he resurrects, he's in the heavenly places. And what, who does he send? He sends the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, who is God, he dwells everywhere. He, doesn't dwell, he is everywhere, but he chooses to dwell in us. In the midst of each and every single one of us, he confines himself to our hearts and our lives. And now Christ is enthroned upon our hearts, upon the praises of his people. Do you guys see this? Amen? This is the gospel. The Ark of the Covenant is the gospel. And it's a, it's a wonderful and beautiful thing, not just, a, just some kind of box, right? And now, here's the, here's the secret here. David knew this secret. When we look at what David is doing, it's radical, right? Again, I'm telling you. I mean, you guys look at me like I'm crazy. But like a president comes up here and he just, the first thing he says is, I'm going to go get a box, box from Russia, right? I mean, you don't, you don't think that's crazy? Because I would look at him and be like, I done voted for the wrong guy, right? I should have voted the other side. But anyways, this guy's adamant. And he's not just saying, I'm going to do it on a personal level. He's saying, all of us, do you guys agree? This box is, we need this box. I got to go to Green and get this box, right? This is what's happening here. But David knew the secret. It wasn't about a box. The ark itself was not the point. It wasn't to be worshipped like a god. It was the bridge that would connect him to God. It was the bridge that would connect man to God, the temporal to the eternal, the physical to the spiritual. And it would connect heaven and earth. He knew that the ark would be the bridge to that connection. Amen? He had to have. Otherwise, he wouldn't take that radical of an action, of a step. The ark that represents God's throne, his rule and reign. What does he do? David places this ark at the center of his kingdom. Jerusalem, the capital of Israel. He places it at the center of his kingdom. And you know what? He could have done it earlier. He was already king before. But once the seven year passes, he gets Jerusalem. He's fully king. And he waits until Jerusalem is his. And he returns the ark to Jerusalem. And what does this mean? Think about this for a second. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Israel, right, is the capital, or not the capital, or I guess you could say, the capital of the world, right? Even if you look on the world map, if you look on the world map, right smack dab in the middle of the world map is Israel. You guys know this? You look at the world map. Israel is right at the heart of the world. And in the heart of, Is heart of Israel is Jerusalem. And at the heart of Jerusalem is the tabernacle. And at the heart of the tabernacle, he places the Ark of the Covenant. Now, you guys have to think about the implications of this. 
this has intense implications. By him placing that ark at the middle of the tabernacle, he's not just placing that ark in the middle of his, his uh, nation or his city. He's placing the tabernacle, the presence, the glory, the throne of God at the center of the entire universe. Amen? And I don't know if David knew this, right? Maybe he did. But this is such a prophetic act. By, by David placing that ark in the middle of that tabernacle, he has now enthroned Jesus, enthroned God as the king of kings and the Lord of lords over all of creation. This is an extremely prophetic act here. And he has now, as he has become king, established the throne of the true king, Yahweh. What is David doing? He is transferring ownership of his kingdom to the true king, God himself. And so what can we take from this? David being so radical about this, this Ark of the Covenant, about worship, about prayer. Because what does he do after this? He sets up that Ark. He sets up that, he sets up that tabernacle. And as we all know, he sets up Levites. He sets up musicians who now worship the Lord and intercede and prophesy and pray 24-7, round the clock for 30 plus years, right? And for 30 plus years, they experience the most prosperous, most abundant uh, time and years and reign of Israel's history. All because of what? Because God, because David places some box in the middle of a tent and has some musicians singing around it and praying around it for 30, 30, some, 30 something years. This was the secret of David. He didn't do nothing crazy. He wasn't some kind of crazy, like, able man who had all the politics right, who had all the, the wisdom in the world. Solomon had all the wisdom in the world, right? David was not Solomon. David was a man after his heart. And David desired the holy things. Amen? David desired the things that God desired. He knew the secret. And he implemented this crazy 24-hour worship and prayer movement system. And that changed everything. It changed everything. What does that mean for us? God is calling us through David's example. He's calling us to do many things. But number one is this. There needs to be a transfer of ownership of the rights to our kingdom to the true king, Jesus Christ. Amen? I was surprised because River sang the song, Jesus Be the Center of It All today. Because like all week, that song, I don't know if you upload it on the chat, but like all week that song was just in my head. Jesus be the center of it all. Jesus be the center of it all. Because as I was thinking about David's tent, right, as I was thinking about the point of worship and the point of the kingdom of God, it is just simply this, to make Jesus the center of everything. He needs to be the center of your life, your hearts, your feelings, your schools, your relationships, everything. Your families, your kingdom, your city, your nation. It all must revolve around the person of Jesus. That is the answer. That is the secret that David knew. And so whether he knew it or not, the prophetic act of him placing the presence of God, the throne room, the throne of Jesus at the center of the universe, that was the most prosperous time in all of history, right? That was a prophetic act. And that's something, we have something to learn from that example. Let's say this together. Jesus, be the center of it all. Amen? David's kingdom right here, it is a, it is a shadow of the heavenly kingdom. If there's any kingdom that you want to look back at, right, any kingdom in history that you want to look back at to study, to understand, and to know how the kingdom of God works, you want to look back at David's rule and reign, right? It is a shadow of the heavenly kingdom and the eternal kingdom that is to come. Now, for us though, again, the point is not this Ark of the Covenant, this box, right? For us, there is no ark. Right now, they don't even know where the ark is, right? This, this box is apparently is like lost and somewhere they're still looking for it. All these conspiracy theories coming up, right? But who is the ark? Who is the bridge and the door between God and man? It is Jesus Christ. We established this, right? Christ dwells in us and Christ must dwell in us at the center of our hearts, our lives, our church, our cities, and the nations. And that is the only answer for everything in this world. The only answer. Now why? Let's look at Colossians 1.17. 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 Colossians 
Colossians 1.17. Let's read this together on the count of three. One, two, three. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Amen? Amen. I'll get into that very real quick. But the scripture says clearly, there's one thing that holds all things together. It's not, it's not gravity. All right? <laughs> it's not gravity. Okay? Gravity holds a lot of things together. Right? But it doesn't hold all things together. There's only one thing that holds all things together. And that is Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus holds all things together. It's by his word. Even Hebrews, right? By his word. By the power of his word. All things are in motion. All things exist because of him. It's all in him, from him, through him, to him. Meaning Jesus is the foundation, the cornerstone, the axis, everything. He's the reason why everything exists. And he's the reason why everything doesn't fall apart. Amen? He's the strongest glue. All right? That's like an easy way to say it, I guess, right? But he's the strongest glue. He's the axis. He's what keeps everything together. Now, again, this prophetic act is the start of that great and most prosperous prosperous 33-year reign in all of Israel's history, right? This is unparalleled. And now, when we speak of these kind of things, I want to give you a warning here. There's always people who come against this kind of talk. When people talk about the Davidic reign, the restoration of worship and prayer, the restoration of the house of prayer and 24-hour and worship and all that kind of stuff, right? There's people that, just that we saw here, right? Micah looks at David, her husband, with, despising, with a despising heart. And they hate this movement. I mean, I don't even want to call it a movement. They hate the fact that worship is being restored, that Jesus, his throne is being restored. They hate it. And you know what they say? They look, at, they look at these people who talk about the ark. They talk about, you know, music, uh, uh, music and, and Levites and all of that kind of stuff. They say, hey, why are you putting a focus on worship and prayer? Are you seeking prosperity like prosperity gospel preachers? They will say that. They will say, hey, wh why, are you so, why are you so worked up about this 72-hour worship conference? Is it to restore prosperity and have abundance in this nation? Is that what you're after? If you love Jesus, shouldn't you love him despite all suffering, all pain, all struggles, regardless of prosperity? You guys understand what I'm saying? People will actually say this. People will say this to you. And you know what? Regardless of these prosperity gospel accusations, it's always the few that ruins it for the rest of us. Isn't that true? It's always the few that ruins it for the rest. It's like, you know, back in the day, I remember I used to go to school in, uh, in Georgia, right? In Georgia. Has anyone been to Georgia here? Atlanta? No? Okay. Atlanta is like, uh, there's a lot of African Americans, a lot of Hispanics, right? Like, now there's a lot of Koreans, because Koreans are everywhere now, right? Koreans, <laughs> Koreans they don't infiltrate, they invaded the world, right? But, but back then, at least, it was a lot of African Americans and Hispanics. And I was like the only Asian, apart from some Japanese girl that... So until middle school, every day in class, man, I'm telling you, these guys, they get the pencils, they right? Every day. And so I'm over here just being a nice little Asian student, right? I'm just doing my homework, doing my thing. And then the teacher comes in, right? And then some kid throws, a, throws a, like a paper ball or like, you know, you know, doing the beep, you know, whatever, right? And then the teacher, because it is one kid, everyone gets in trouble. And I'm always feeling like, man, I'm doing all the right things. I'm doing whatever, whatever I'm supposed to be doing. But because it is one person, ruins it for the rest of us. Ain't that the worst? You guys don't have this experience? Oh, you guys were the bad ones. You guys were the paper throwers and the pencil whatever, right? The river was the baddest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I guess it's just me. But anyways, I always think, man, why is it that the few always have to ruin it for the rest of us? Right? It's almost like... I heard this example somewhere where you look at someone playing a cover of a song. It's like someone plays a cover of, I don't know, what's a real good song out there? I don't know. Like, anyways, cover of a really famous song. And then, and then you listen to the cover and you go, man, that song sucks. But really, it's that the cover player, they played the song wrong. And the song, the original song itself is really good, Right? So you cannot let the cover ruin your perception of the original artist. Amen? 
So you cannot let someone who portrays Christ wrong and portrays Scripture wrong, you cannot let that taint your perception of truth in Scripture. Amen? So same thing here. You know, if you're calling people who are focused, of course, you cannot just talk about worship and prayer. You have to, you have to get the whole counsel of God, right? Repentance, salvation, faith, all of these things. But to put a focus on worship and prayer, you cannot treat that like that's, a, that's too radical and too wrong of a thing. Because then now you're pointing fingers at David and saying this guy was in the wrong mind. Amen? Because David was radical for worship. This guy, of course he understood salvation. Of course he understood repentance. Of course he understood all that. He had a relationship with the Lord. But in that, he was maniac. He was a maniac for worship. He was crazy about it. To the point where he would put all of his time, all of his resources. He didn't care what the whole nation thought of him. The first thing he was going to do was go bring this box back and restore worship nationwide. That's how crazy he was about worship. Amen? And so for us to say, for people to say, hey, this, this focus is the wrong focus. No, you can't say that because then you're calling out David because this guy was the man who was after God's own heart. Was he in it for earthly benefit? No. David, when he was restoring worship, when he was crazy for worship, was he seeking material riches? Was he thinking, oh, if I restore this, if I start putting musicians around this box, now this nation is just going to be uh, prosperous and I'm going to be the richest king in all of history. That was not his mindset. How do we know this? Because God says this man was a man after his own heart. To worship, to have a heart for radical worship and prayer is to be a man after his own heart. Amen? It is not some kind of movement, but it is the portal. It is the channel. It is the bridge to relationship with God. It is the, the channel through which heaven and earth collide and meet. Without worship and prayer, there is no heaven on earth. Amen? You could go and try all the things you want. But without the, with the lack of worship and prayer, you will never connect the divine and the physical. It's not possible. This is the spiritual principle that David knew. And when you align yourself proper, properly, things fall into place. It's not David's fault that it was prosperous. It's not David's fault that it was. That's what happens when the kingdom of God comes. Amen. When the kingdom of God comes, what happens again? Darkness flees. When the kingdom of God comes, sin is gone. When the kingdom of God comes, miracles and healings happen. But people look at the miracles and healings and then they say, hey, that's all you're in it for. No. That's the fruit of the kingdom of God. Amen. No suffering, no weeping, no pain in the eternal kingdom. But now in this age, as long as we're in this age, there's always going to be a war between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Always a war. But does that mean just because the kingdom of God comes and, and there might be some prosperity and abundance and miracles and healings, then just because of that, do we say, oh, okay, we're not about prosperity. We're not about good things. We're not about healings. We're not about miracles. We're not about signs. We're just going to stay gospel-centered and just, just suffer. Is that the mindset? No, we align ourselves with God and his heart and we allow him to establish the kingdom and we advance it and expand it continuously against the kingdom of darkness as long as we live in this age, amen? Through worship and prayer. We're not in it for signs and healings. We're not here in it for miracles. But when God is established, his kingdom is established, that is the natural byproduct, the perfection of his kingdom is, is being established, amen? That's what happens. The kingdom of God. And you know what? Someone said this once before. Jesus being established on that throne is, again, absolutely necessary. Now, why is it absolutely necessary? Because the ark is the untouchable thing. Now, for those of you that know, that know and don't know, maybe don't know, right? This ark, because God's presence dwells on this ark, right? It is holy. And if you touch this ark, you do what? You risk death. You risk death, right? So even back in the Old Testament, there was only one way that you could carry this ark, right? It was through the Levites. They were put on their shoulders, and that's the only way they could carry it. If anyone else touches this ark, they're gone, right? 
And now, for David to place it at the center, an untouchable thing, to place that at the center of a community, to place that at the center of a nation, that's exactly what you want to do. Why? Why? Because when you place something that is untouchable at the center of a structure, that thing cannot be swayed. That thing cannot be impacted. That thing cannot be changed. That thing cannot be shattered. That thing will always stand. And what you want at the foundation and at the, at the axis, at the axiom of anything is something that will never change. Amen? And what is the only thing that will never change, the only thing that will never be swayed and impacted by anything in this world, it is Jesus and the word of God. And so when you place the word of God as the foundation, as the, as the centerpiece structure in your heart, in your life, in all that you do, you will be victorious. Amen? You are setting yourself up for prosperity, not for material blessing. And I'm not talking about that kind of prosperity, right? I'm, I'm saying when you, place, when you place the word of God at the center, Jesus at the center of your life, you are now establishing the perfect kingdom of God. That's what's happening there. You want something like the ark. And there is nothing like the ark other than Jesus, right? You want Jesus, the ark of the covenant, at the center. And if you place anything else at the center of a community, at the center of your family, at the center of your relationship, at the center of your heart, if you place anything else there, it will crumble. It will crumble no matter what. And you know what? That centerpiece is so important. I don't know if anyone here has ever played a... Has anyone here ever played like a, like a sports game? I don't think anyone here would have ever played sports games. I just have a feeling. <laughs> you have? Like basketball, 2K? Soccer? Okay. I don't know about, I don't know about soccer, but I, I'm a basketball fan, right? So uh, in, in basketball, there's five people on, on the team, right? There's a point guard. There's a shooting guard. There's a small forward. There's a power forward. And then there's the center, right? The center is the big guy. It's always the big guy. Right? Because he has to guard the rim and he has to post up and put it in when, when they're on offense, right? Now, this center, to me at least, right, and I think principally is true, is the most important part of that team. It's the guy that holds that team down. You know, the small guy, the power, the point guards, right, they're usually flashy. They usually got all the skills. They do all that stuff, right? And, and they look good and all that. But if there's a good center, they can never get past that guy. Do you know a guy named Shaquille O'Neal? Shaquille O'Neal was the most dominant center in all of NBA history, right? When that guy was on, on the Lakers, man, that team was unstoppable. Absolutely unstoppable, right? And so they would put two, three guys on Shaq just to guard him. This guy demands two, three guys. That tells you a lot, right? And if you are as flashy as you can be, you can do all the, all the tricks you want, right? But if you have a bad center on your team... Your, your defense and your offense, all of that crumbles. It does, right? But I see a spiritual principle in this. The centerpiece of anything that you do, right, anything is absolutely the most important part because that's what holds things together. Without that, it crumbles and falls apart. And I say this again. Let's proclaim this together. Jesus, sorry, let's say it one more time. When Jesus becomes the center, everything changes. Amen? This prophetic act is not just a, is something to, to, to bypass, right? There's such a truth right there. The heart of David to, to see the, the, the mysterious secret of worship and prayer, to see what that brings, to see what it means to have the Ark of the Covenant at the center of not just the city, but the nation, but all of creation, to put it at the heart he knows the secret there. And I pray that all of us here today, as we hear this word, that we would have an increased value, an increased adoration of, of true worship and spirit and truth. Amen? When we worship and pray, again, we are inviting Jesus to establish his rule and reign. And, and establishing that throne casts out darkness, casts out sickness. Cast out evil, cast out sin, and light and darkness cannot coexist. And beloved, there's a reason 
why David elevated this to a national level and a national concern. Because once again, I say this again, only answer to all of those problems in this world, to all of your personal problems, to all of the wicked things that you see on the news every single day, the only answer is Jesus. I could say this again and again and again and again throughout the whole sermon. Such a simple, simple message, right? But it's the only answer. It's the only answer. And I could stand here every week and say the same thing, but it will still be the only answer. Through worship and prayer, our role as the body of Christ, wherever we go, as the carriers of his presence. This is what the Levites are, right? We are the carriers of his presence. Wherever we step, wherever we go, our role is nothing but worship and prayer, proclaiming his kingship, his lordship, and inviting down the kingdom of God on this earth. That's our role as the body of Christ. And when you get this mindset, everything changes. Now, again, I say this again. These knife incidents that's been happening uh, these past couple days, you know, that really breaks my heart. It breaks my heart on two sen- in two senses. One sense, there's people obviously getting hurt. And I think the two people passed from this. I think one person passed recently at Soyon, right? And then I think someone else, was there at Shilim? A couple people, right? People are, are, are losing their lives over nonsense like this. Just, this is not even just evil. This is, this is insane, wicked, to the extreme kind of evil, right? That's one sense. But the other sense is this. These kids, they're kids. Like, their birthday is like 02. Do we have any 02s in here? Anywhere near 02? How old are you? 03? Oh, man. 02, 03. All right. 02, 03. Kids, like, that age, right around that age, they're saying on those death notes, their death threats, right? I have no reason to live anymore. I have no hope. There's nothing left for me anymore. So I'm just going to do the most damage that I can before I leave this earth. That's the mindset that they're prepared with when they're going out doing these things. That should break all of our hearts right now. Not because... Of course, on one level, in a physical sense, this is violence. This is dangerous. People are losing their lives. People are losing their sons, their, their, their families, husbands, wives. All of these things, that's one level. But the other level is a generation is dying. Spiritually decaying. They have absolutely no hope in this life. Why? Because they lack love. That's the main reason. Because they lack love. They have no, they have no one, not a single person in their life that believes in them, that trusts in them, that has fathered them, that has actually given them genuine, the genuine love of a father. They've never experienced that. And that void, it leads them to this result. And this breaks my heart. But I want to say this. The kingdom of God, when we worship and pray, when we're inviting heaven to earth, Yes, on one level, it sounds, it's very governmental. It's very authority-based, right? And, and it sounds like, you know, healing, all those kind of things, right? But in the other sense, what are you doing? You're inviting the Father's love to be poured out in this generation. Amen? The kingdom of God and the Father's love, they're the same thing. The kingdom of God and the Father's house, that's the same thing. So when we see these kind of things, it is even more crucial And even more absolutely necessary for us to gather as a body and proclaim the kingship of Jesus to bring down that kingdom. Because that is the only way these children, these kids, these young adults are going to be healed from that trauma. There's no other answer. There's no other way other than to proclaim the kingship, the rule and reign of Christ and say, have your way, Holy Spirit. Bring healing. Pour out the Father's love in this next generation. That's the only way. You know why? Because God is sovereign. Because God is king. And he rules and reigns over all creation upon that throne room. And and so the other flip side of this is this. For all of us here, I know for me it's been a fact. I I know for some of us it's it's been a fact, right? Because we're still in the flesh. We're still humans. Yeah, we stress. We have fear, right? We walk around these streets. I mean, I come around here all the time. So I know a person who's getting their hair cut right next to that person, uh, that incident at that day, right? And so, yes, we worry about our family. We worry about our friends. And right now, I just plead the blood of Christ over this body. Just protect this body, Lord Jesus. 
let the spirit of death pass over as it did in the days of Israel. But you know what? Yes, there is a fear that comes, but God's saying we do not need to fear. Because our, our lives, again, are not in the hands of men. Our lives are not in the hands of a situation. You could go to the most dangerous place in the world, right? There's a missionary that said this in our church not too long ago. He said, you, you could go to the most dangerous, dangerous places in the Middle East all you want, but you will not die because of a dangerous situation. You die when God says it's time for you to die. God doesn't kill you. I'm sorry, don't, don't say that. I'm not saying God kills you, right? But your life is in God's hands. He is sovereign over your coming out or going out and your coming in, coming out, going in, going out, coming in, whatever, right? He's sovereign over your life. So do not fear for fear does not come from the Lord. Amen? So do not fear going out in these streets. I'm not saying be reckless, right? We have responsibility over our lives, you know. Don't be reckless being like, I'm just, I'm free. I'm, you know what I mean? That's stupid. But in precaution, being careful, know that your life is in the Lord's hands. Now in faith, walk out with authority and in boldness against the schemes of the enemy. Amen? Absolutely necessary for the kingdom of God to come and to press forth and advance and expand in the midst of what we see going on in us, uh, right, right around us. It tells us even more clearly our role as the body. It gives us even a more definite vision and a purpose and a reason for something like David's tent. 72 hours of unending worship and prayer, you know what? It shouldn't stop at 72 hours. This is just... This is just a, a glimpse of what we're contending for, eternity. Amen? Worship is eternal. Right now, the worship is going on 24-7 in heaven, and it's never going to stop. And on this earth, these 72 hours, that's nothing. If you can't do 72 hours of worship and prayer, I know that's hard for all of us. I'm, I get tired too, obviously, right? But if that doesn't excite you, then you got to check your heart. Because that's what's going to be going on in heaven 24-7. And David's tent is not going to stop on Wednesday at 4 p.m. David's tent is not a conference. David's tent is not a tent. David's tent is not some kind of building. David's tent is us. Amen. God is calling in these last days, David's tabernacle, the saints who are radical, just as David was, for worship and prayer to be restored in these last days and now stand as the answer, the solution, the salt and light for this world in these wicked and perverse times. This is what he's calling for us today. And so as the worship team comes back up, I'm going to read from Amos 9, 11 to 12. Amos chapter 9, verses 11 to 12. It says this. It says, on that day, meaning on that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. That they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. Amen. The prophecy is here. It says that God is going to, in the last days, restore the tabernacle of David. This, this I don't even know what you, what you call it, this shabby tent. It's just some shabby tent. He didn't say, I'm going to restore the glorious temple of Solomon. Because right after David's tent is the glorious temple with all its adornations or, you know, uh, furnishings and all its glory beautifully built where God's presence dwells. But God doesn't say, I'm going to restore the temple of Solomon. He says, I'm going to restore the tabernacle of David. Just some shabby tent with an ark in the middle, musicians and intercessors. Just circling around it, worshiping it 24-7. That's what's on God's heart. Why? Why? Because once again, it says in, in this passage that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. What does this mean? In order for missions to go out to the ends of the earth and in order for all of God's people all the Gentiles, all the lost people right now in all of this earth, in order for them to come back, worship and prayer must be restored. Amen? Missions 
and worship and prayer, they go hand in hand. And in order for Jesus to return, he says it clearly in Matthew, right? He will not return until the gospel is preached to the ends of the earth. And so in order for Jesus to come and establish his full reign once and for all, where there's now no more weeping, no more suffering, but just a perfect and eternal kingdom and perfect fellowship and communion with Jesus, in order for that to come, the gospel must be preached to the ends of the earth. And in order for the gospel to be preached to the ends of the earth, it cannot be done on our own strength with some kind of organizational strategies. The only answer right here, it says that the tabernacle of David, worship and prayer must be restored. Do you believe this? We're not restoring worship and prayer for the sake of worship and prayer. I keep saying this. But we are obsessed about worship and prayer. Why? Because we are calling out as the bride for our bridegroom king to come swiftly. This is a love call. Worship and prayer is a love call of the bride of Christ. Amen? To hear the footsteps of the king. We like this phrase right here. The things that are happening around this world right now, all of these signs of the end of the age, on one side, it's a curse. The world that does not know the king, the world that does not know Jesus, from that perspective, this is a curse. You see all of these things that are happening, you go, oh, this world is getting worse and worse and worse. We have no more hope, so might as well just go kill people. That's what's happening. Because there's no hope. There's no living hope for these people. And it's the same thing with the ark. For those who do not know the secret of this ark, it's a curse to them. Just as the Philistines, they took this box and plagues and sicknesses and curse would fall upon this nation. They say, you could have it back. They stood on this side. But here's the secret. When you stand on this side of that ark, just as David did, it leads to blessing. It leads to prosperity. It leads to life. Amen? And so the same curses that you see in this world right now, the same destruction and signs and all of these horrible things that are going on, yes, it breaks our heart. Yes, in one sense, it's, it's unfathomable. How can these things happen? But we take that as the footsteps of the king. We see the same thing from a different perspective. And we cry out to the Lord, come Lord Jesus, we need you. Getting closer and closer to the end, the last days, we tune our ears to the footsteps of our bridegroom king as the bride of Christ. And we put everything, not in other sources, not in other solutions and answers, but just as scripture says, and just as David knew the secret as he restored that Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem, at the center of his life, of his kingdom, of his city, nation, and all of creation, God is calling us, place me, the Ark of the Covenant, the Word of God, place it in the center of your heart. Place it in the center of your life. Place it in the center of your family, your church. Place it in the center of this city and this nation. Now, offer up worship and praise and prayer. Restore worship and prayer and enthrone now my throne, my kingdom, my rule and reign in all of creation. That is the only answer. Not because of prosperity. Not because of material abundant blessings. But because when the kingdom of God comes, darkness is cast out. When the kingdom of God comes, evil ends. When the kingdom of God comes, sickness is gone. Healing comes restoration comes revival comes and you know what life comes kingdom of God equals life amen and so you want to know how to save a nation you want to know how to save a people you want to know how to save your family a broken relationship a broken misaligned life all the problems that you got going in your personal life you want to know how to restore those things let's say it together the kingdom of God let's proclaim it together the kingdom of God the kingdom of God will save a nation. Amen? Amen? The kingdom of God is the only way to save a nation. Amen. It's the only way to save your families. 
It's the only way to save yourself. It's the only way to, you can't save yourself. The kingdom of God, right? The kingdom of God is the only way. And this is why I keep going back to that verse earlier when we prayed. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of all that's going on in your life. Don't be afraid of your problems, your own weaknesses. Don't be afraid of that. Don't look at that. Nehemiah says, look to your God who is great and awesome. Do not be afraid of them. But look to your God now. Pick up your weapons and fight for your brothers, your mothers, your sisters, your wives, your husbands, your children. Beloved, kingdom of God equals spiritual warfare. They're the same thing. So when you say we're engaging in spiritual warfare, advancing the king, you're advancing the kingdom of God. That is spiritual warfare. You're fighting against the dark forces of this world, the spiritual forces the hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. To fight against them is to proclaim the kingdom of God through worship and through prayer. Amen? Again, not just some kind of religious organization activity where we come here every week, every Sunday, every Saturday, just playing keyboards, just playing the guitar, just singing and then going home and, and feeling like everything is done for the week. No, this is warfare. This is warfare. And so with that in mind, I want to ask you guys to now rise to your feet. And we're going to do one thing today. As we pray, David knew the secret of worship. David knew the secret of prayer. David knew the secret of placing his presence, his throne at the center. And so I want us to pray like this. Holy Spirit, the same revelation that you gave to David the revelation that made him confess, Lord, I would not even sleep. I would lose sleep. I would not even get to that point until I find a place for you to dwell in. Lord, if there's anything I want, Lord, I don't want the prosperity. I don't want the kingdom. I don't want all of that power and authority. Lord, the only thing I want is one thing. One thing I have desired is to just dwell in your house, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. That's the one thing I desire, just to worship you, just to be in relationship with you, just to be in your courts, in the Father's house, just to transfer my kingdom, my ownership of my life, of this city, of this nation, to you, the rightful king. The only thing I want, Jesus, is for you to be the center of it all. Establish your rule. Establish your reign. And let the kingdom of God come on earth as it is in heaven in South Korea as it is in heaven in TCCI and TCC as it is in heaven in my family and in my life as it is in heaven Jesus would you be the center of it all because you are the answer beloved let's just begin to proclaim mind you this is spiritual warfare proclaiming the kingship of Jesus. Let's just repeat after me. Jesus is King. One more time. Jesus is Lord. Let's just lift up this proclamation as we enter into prayer. Let's pray. Yes, Lord. Jesus, we proclaim that you are King of Kings. We proclaim that you are Lord of Lords. We see the significance. We see the magnitude of that proclamation, God. Would you be the center of it all, Lord? Would you be the center of it all? Your glory. Your presence, Lord. Let your kingdom come on this earth as it is in heaven. Through the worship of the saints. Through prayer of the saints, God. Yes, Lord. Establish your throne. Establish your rule and reign, Jesus. Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Once and for all, would you restore the tabernacle thing? Would you restore the worship Jesus. and prayer that is pleasing to you? Would you restore praise that enthrones you as king of this nation?
nothing else but you, Jesus. Would you rule and reign, Holy Spirit? Would you rule and reign, Holy Spirit? Some are here permanently, some are here for a, a long time. I don't know what the reason is, but I don't believe in coincidences. And the Lord has placed each and every one of us in this nation for a reason. And I believe that at a time like this, especially for us to be here gathered as TCCI, there is a calling on TCC and, and TCCI as well, of course, uh, to pray for the nation. And uh, I know some of us here won't be attending Davis Tent next week. You know, 72 hours worship, prayer, you guys won't be able to attend because of school, because of personal reasons, because of work, and, and that's okay. But even regardless of the fact that you can't attend, I want you to understand that this applies to you. Because that tent is not Davis Tent. We are Davis Tent. Each and every one of us here standing as a worshiper after God's own heart, just as David said, just as David did. God is seeking in the last days worshipers who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so I want us to pray like this. As we pray for this nation, let's pray specifically for David's tents. That through the restoration of worship and prayer, that through this 72-hour worship and prayer conference, that more worshipers, more intercessors would rise up in this time. And that as worship ascends, that as prayer ascends, that as the word is proclaimed and prophecy is proclaimed, and as the kingdom of God is released and the, the throne of God is invited into this nation, let's pray that the spiritual atmosphere over the nation of Korea would just begin to shift and, and you know even all of those influences spiritually that have been laying strongholds over this nation whether it's shamanism whether it's the spirit of Buddhism whether it's Confucianism all of these strongholds that grip this nation that continue to try to bind it as, as Christianity is starting to get its foundation it's 
binding it and constricting it so that it cannot grow and grow and burst out into revival. Let's pray that David's tent would cut off those strong ones and break it down in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. David's tent, through the worship and prayer, not just through that tent, through that building, but through the worship and prayer of all sense, whether they're in that location or not in that location, that as we invite the king to this nation, that the kingdom of God would be manifested and established in the nation of Korea. So Holy Spirit, we ask you right now in the name of Jesus, Father, as we lift up worship to you, as we lift up prayer to you, unending, just as in the days of David's era, God. Lord, we ask that you would shift the atmosphere of this nation, God. That you would break down chains. That you would break down a, a strongholds, Lord. That you would loosen bondages over this nation. And every evil, every, every anti-Christ spirit that is trying to gain access over the nation of South Korea. Father, we come against it right now in Jesus' name. And we say, would you have your way through the restoration of worship and prayer, would you establish your kingdom once and for all and have rule a rulership and, and reign over the nation of Korea. Beloved, let's just intercede for this nation as the body of Christ, especially for David's tent uh, next week for the 72 hours of worship and prayer. Let's just lift our voices and begin to intercede for David's tent. Let's pray. Yes, Jesus, we ask you, God, would you establish your kingdom? Would you establish your perfect rule and reign over the nation of South Korea? With all strongholds over this nation, God. With all evil, with all spirits from all of the history of this nation that continue to try to grip, that continue to constrict. Would you cut it off right now in Jesus' name? Change the flow. to your throne that was blood bought the reason we can rejoice and press on in any given circumstance the reason we can give thanks in all of our pain and in our suffering 
is because though we were sinners, you, God, who were not, who was not bound by anything, by time or by space, who is infinite, you chose to come down to this earth. And you bound yourself to time. You bound your, yourself to space. You bound yourself to our experience and came as the man in the person of Jesus Christ. You walked this earth just like us. You ate and drank just like us. You suffered and went through pain just like us. You went through every temptation and trial just like us, God. And yet you lived a sinless and perfect life. You are the righteous one. And you hung on that cross. You took all of our shame, our guilt, our humiliation, all of our sin. And you drank that cup, the wrath of God, the punishment for all sinners. You took it upon yourself, Lord. You who knew no sin bore the sins of many. And you took the punishment and died on that cross. And in three days, on the third day, through the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit, you rose from that grave. And now you are seated. You ascended and are now seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly places. And now you've sent us the helper, the comforter. You've sent us the Holy Spirit on the day of the Pentecost as they cried out to you in prayer, in worship you sent that fire and that wind to now for the first time in history through the Spirit you dwell in us Jesus, the God of all the universe you dwell in us God confined yourself into our hearts and even in our weakness and in the midst of our sinfulness even now you choose to dwell among us you choose to tabernacle in us Lord we thank you for that glorious privilege and honor we thank you that even now you are not resurrecting a building you're not resurrecting another tent but you tabernacle in the midst of us and you are resurrecting true David's tents true tabernacles true temples true worshipers who will now worship you in spirit and in truth and invite the king to tabernacle amongst them Lord we believe this is the key we know that this is the answer we know that this is the salt and light. We know that this is the key to the kingdom of God. Lord, we ask that in this next couple weeks, for those who are attending Davis Tent, for those who are not attending Davis Tent, let it not stop at a conference. Let it not be confined to the walls of a building. Lord, but we proclaim that we are Davis Tents. We proclaim that you are king over this nation. And we ask that you would now begin to shift the atmosphere. That you would cut off all misaligned flows. Cut off all flows that do not come from you in our personal lives. Anything out of alignment, bring it back into alignment. Anything in this nation, if it's out of alignment, bring it back into alignment, God. Cut off every flow that does not come from you. And now let the rivers of living water start to flow across this nation. And would you save this people? Would you save this nation? Would you save all of creation and hasten the return of our King Jesus? As we look to you, Lord, as we set our eyes with one thing, just gazing upon the beauty of who you are. Come, Lord Jesus, and establish your rule and reign once and for all, Lord. Lord, we thank you. We love you, Lord. We hear your footsteps. And we cry out to you, Lord, as your bride. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Let's give up a round of applause. Give glory and praise to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.